Chapter 36 Daenerys The stench of the camp was so appalling it was all that Danny could do not to gag. Sir Barristan wrinkled up his nose and said, "'Your grace should not be here, breathing these black humors.' "'I am the blood of the dragon,' Danny reminded him. "'Have you ever seen a dragon with the flux?' Viserys had oft claimed that Targaryens were untroubled by the pestilences that afflicted common men, and so far as she could tell, it was true. She could remember being cold and hungry and afraid, but never sick. Even so, the old knight said, I would feel better if your grace would return to the city. The many-colored brick walls of Meereen were half a mile back. The bloody flux has been the bane of every army since the Dawn Age. Let us distribute the food, Your Grace. On the morrow. I am here now. I want to see. She put her heels into her silver. The others trotted after her. Jogo rode before her, Ago and Ricaro just behind, long Dothraki whips in hand to keep away the sick and dying. Sir Barristan was at her right mounted on a dapple grey. To her left was Simon Strypeback of the Free Brothers and Marcellin of the Mother's Men. Threescore soldiers followed close behind the captains to protect the food wagons. Mounted men all, Dothraki and Brazen Beasts and Freedmen, they were united only by their distaste for this duty. The Astapori stumbled after them in a ghastly procession that grew longer with every yard they crossed. Some spoke tongues she did not understand. Others were beyond speaking. Many lifted their hands to Danny, or knelt as her silver went by. Mother! they called to her, in the dialects of Astapor, Lys, and Old Volantis, in guttural Dothraki and the liquid syllables of Carth, even in the common tongue of Westeros. Mother, please! Mother, help my sister! She's sick. Give me food for my little ones. Please, my old father, help him. Help her. Help me. I have no more help to give, Danny thought, despairing. The Astapori had no place to go. Thousands remained outside Meereen's thick walls. Men and women and children, old men and little girls and newborn babes. Many were sick, most were starved, and all were doomed to die. Daenerys dare not open her gates to let them in. She had tried to do what she could for them. She had sent them healers, blue graces, and spell singers, and barber surgeons. But some of those had sickened as well, and none of their arts had slowed the galloping progression of the flux that had come on the pale mare. Separating the healthy from the sick had proved impractical as well. Her stalwart shields had tried, pulling husbands away from wives and children from their mothers, even as the Astapori wept and kicked and pelted them with stones. A few days later, the sick were dead and the healthy ones were sick. Dividing the one from the other had accomplished nothing. Even feeding them had grown difficult. Every day she sent them what she could, but every day there were more of them and less food to give them. It was growing harder to find drivers willing to deliver the food as well. Too many of the men they had sent into the camp had been stricken by the flux themselves. Others had been attacked on the way back to the city. Yesterday a wagon had been overturned and two of her soldiers killed, so today the queen had determined that she would bring the food herself. Every one of her advisers had argued fervently against it, from Resnak and the shave pate to Sir Barristan, but Daenerys would not be moved. "'I will not turn away from them,' she said stubbornly. "'A queen must know the sufferings of her people.' Suffering was the only thing they did not lack. "'There is scarcely a horse or mule left, though many rode from Astapor,' Marcellin reported to her. They've eaten every one, your grace, along with every rat and scavenger dog that they could catch. Now some have begun to eat their own dead. Man must not eat the flesh of man, said Argo. 
It is known, agreed Ricaro. They will be cursed. They're past cursing, said Simon Stripe back. Little children with swollen stomachs trailed after them, too weak or scared to beg. Gaunt men with sunken eyes squatted amidst sand and stones, shitting out their lives in stinking streams of brown and red. Many shat where they slept now, too feeble to crawl to the ditches she'd commanded them to dig. Two women fought over a charred bone. Nearby, a boy of ten stood eating a rat. He ate one-handed, the other clutching a sharpened stick lest anyone try to wrest away his prize. Unburied dead lay everywhere. Danny saw one man sprawled in the dirt under a black cloak, but as she rode past, his cloak dissolved into a thousand flies. Skeletal women sat upon the ground clutching dying infants. Their eyes followed her. Those who had the strength called out, Mother! Please, Mother! Bless you, Mother! Bless me, Danny thought bitterly. Your city has gone to ash and bone. Your people are dying all around me. I have no shelter for you, no medicine, no hope. Only stale bread and wormy meat, hard cheese, a little milk. Bless me, bless me. What kind of mother has no milk to feed her children? Too many dead, Argo said. They should be burned. Who will burn them? asked Sir Barristan. The bloody flux is everywhere. A hundred die each night. It is not good to touch the dead, said Jogo. This is known, Argo and Ricaro said together. That may be so, said Danny but this thing must be done all the same. She thought a moment. The Unsullied have no fear of corpses. I shall speak to Grey Worm. Your grace, said Sir Barristan, the Unsullied are your best fighters. We dare not loose this plague amongst them. Let the Astapori bury their own dead. They are too feeble, said Simon Stripe back. Danny said, more food might make them stronger. Simon shook his head. Food should not be wasted on the dying, your worship. We do not have enough to feed the living. He was not wrong, she knew, but that did not make the words any easier to hear. This is far enough, the queen decided. We'll feed them here. She raised a hand. Behind her, the wagons bumped to a halt, and her riders spread out around them to keep the Ostapori from rushing at the food. No sooner had they stopped than the press began to thicken around them, as more and more of the afflicted came limping and shambling toward the wagons. The riders cut them off. "'Wait your turn!' they shouted. "'No pushing! Back! Stay back! Bread for everyone! Wait your turn!' Danny could only sit and watch. "'Sir,' she said to Barristan Selmy, is there no more we can do? You have provisions, provisions for your grace's soldiers. We may well need to withstand a long siege. The storm crows and the second sons can harry the Yunkishmen, but they cannot hope to turn them. If your grace would allow me to assemble an army, if there must be a battle, I would sooner fight it from behind the walls of Mirin. Let the Yunkai try and storm my battlements." The queen surveyed the scene around her. If we were to share our food equally, the Astapori would eat through their portion in days, and we would have that much less for the siege. Danny gazed across the camp to the many-colored brick walls of Mirin. The air was thick with flies and cries. The gods have sent this pestilence to humble me. So many dead... I will not have them eating corpses, she beckoned Ago closer. Ride to the gates and bring me Grey Worm and fifty of his unsullied. Khaleesi, the blood of your blood obeys. Ago touched his horse with his heels and galloped off. Sir Barristan watched with ill-concealed apprehension. 
you should not linger here over long, your grace. The Astoporia being fed as you commanded, there's no more we can do for the poor wretches. We should repair back to the city. Go if you wish, sir. I will not detain you. I will not detain any of you. Danny vaulted down from the horse. I cannot heal them, but I can show them that their mother cares. Jogo sucked in his breath. Galisi, no! The bell in his braid rang softly as he dismounted. You must not get any closer. Do not let them touch you. Do not! Danny walked right past him. There was an old man on the ground a few feet away, moaning and staring up at the gray belly of the clouds. She knelt beside him, wrinkling her nose at the smell, and pushed back his dirty gray hair to feel his brow. His flesh is on fire. I need water to bathe him. Sea water will serve. Marcellin, will you fetch some for me? I need oil as well, for the pyre. Who will help me burn the dead? By the time Ago returned with Grey Worm and fifty of the unsullied loping behind his horse, Danny had shamed all of them into helping her. Simon Stripeback and his men were pulling the living from the dead and stacking up the corpses while Jogo and Ricaro and their Dothraki helped those who could still walk toward the shore to bathe and wash their clothes. Ago stared at them as if they had all gone mad, but Grey Worm knelt beside the queen and said, This one would be of help. Before midday, a dozen fires were burning. Columns of greasy black smoke rose up to stain a merciless blue sky. Danny's riding clothes were stained and sooty as she stepped back from the pyres. Worship, Grey Worm said. This one and his brothers beg your leave to bathe in the salt sea when our work here is done, that we might be purified according to the laws of our great goddess. The queen had not known that the eunuchs had a goddess of their own. Who is this goddess? One of the gods of geese? Grey Worm looked troubled. The goddess is called by many names. She is the Lady of Spears, the Bride of Battle, the Mother of Hosts. But her true name belongs only to these poor ones who have burned their manhoods upon her altar. We may not speak of her to others. This one begs your forgiveness. As you wish. Yes, you may bathe if that is your desire. Thank you for your help. These ones live to serve you. When Daenerys returned to her pyramid sore of limb and sick of heart, she found Missandei reading some old scroll whilst Yuri and Jiqui argued about Ricaro. "'You are too skinny for him,' Jiqui was saying. "'You are almost a boy. Ricaro does not bed with boys. This is known.' Eerie bristled back. "'It is known that you are almost a cow. Ricaro does not bed with cows. Ricaro is blood of my blood.' His life belongs to me, not you, Danny told the two of them. Ricaro had grown almost half a foot during his time away from Meereen, and returned with arms and legs thick with muscle and four bells in his hair. He towered over Ago and Jogo now, as her handmaids had both noticed. Now be quiet. I need to bathe. She had never felt more soiled. Jiqui, help me from these clothes... Then take them away and burn them. Eerie, tell Keza to find me something light and cool to wear. The day was very hot. A cool wind was blowing on her terrace. Danny sighed with pleasure as she slipped into the waters of her pool. At her command, Miss Ande stripped off her clothes and climbed in after her. This one heard the Ostopori scratching at the walls last night, the little scribe said as she was washing Danny's back. Eerie and Jiqui exchanged a look. "'No one was scratching,' said Jiqui. "'Scratching? How could they scratch?' "'With their hands,' said Miss Ande. "'The bricks are old and crumbling. "'They are trying to claw their way into the city. "'This would take them many years,' said Eerie. "'The walls are very thick. "'This is known. "'It is known,' agreed Jiqui. I dream of them as well. Danny took Missande's hand. 
The camp is a good half mile from the city, my sweetling. No one was scratching at the walls. Your grace knows best, said Miss Ande. Shall I wash your hair? It is almost time. Resnak Mo Resnak and the Green Grace are coming to discuss the wedding preparations. Danny sat up with a splash. I had almost forgotten. Perhaps I wanted to forget. And after them, I am to dine with his star. She sighed. Erie, bring the green tokar, the silk one fringed with mirish lace. That one is being repaired, Khaleesi. The lace was torn. The blue tokar has been cleaned. Blue, then. They will be just as pleased. She was only half wrong. The priestess and the seneschal were happy to see her garbed in a tokar, a proper Miranese lady for once, but what they really wanted was to strip her bare. Daenerys heard them out, incredulous. When they were done, she said, I have no wish to give offense, but I will not present myself naked to Hisdar's mother and sisters. But, said Resnak Mo Resnak, blinking, but you must, your worship. Before a marriage, it is traditional for the women of the man's house to examine the bride's womb and, uh, uh, female parts, to ascertain that they are well-formed and, uh, fertile, finished Galaza Galar. An ancient ritual, your radiance. Three graces shall be present to witness the examination and say the proper prayers. Yes, said Resnak, and afterward there is a special cake, a women's cake, baked only for betrothals. Men are not allowed to taste it. I am told it is delicious, magical. And if my womb is withered and my female parts accursed, is there a special cake for that as well? His star Zolo Rock may inspect my women's parts after we are wed. Caldrogo found no fault with them. Why should he? Let his mother and his sisters examine one another and share the special cake. I shall not be eating it. Nor shall I wash the noble his star's noble feet. A magnificence you do not understand, protested Resnak. The washing of the feet is hallowed by tradition. It signifies that you shall be your husband's handmaid. The wedding garb is fraught with meaning, too. The bride is dressed in dark red veils above a tokar of white silk, fringed with baby pearls. The queen of the rabbits must not be wed without her floppy ears. All those pearls will make me rattle when I walk. The pearls symbolize fertility. The more pearls your worship wears, the more healthy children she will bear. Why would I want a hundred children? Danny turned to the green grace. If we should wed by Westerosi rites, the gods of geese would deem it no true union. Galaza Galar's face was hidden behind a veil of green silk. Only her eyes showed, green and wise and sad. In the eyes of the city you would be the noble his star's concubine, not his lawful wedded wife. Your children would be bastards. Your worship must marry his star in the Temple of the Graces, with all the nobility of Mirene on hand to bear witness to your union. Get the heads of all the noble houses out of their pyramids on some pretext, Dario had said. The dragon's words are fire and blood. Danny pushed the thought aside. It was not worthy of her. As you wish, she sighed. I shall marry his star in the Temple of the Graces, wrapped in a white tokar, fringed with baby pearls. Is there anything else? One more small matter, your worship, said Resnak. To celebrate your nuptials, it would be most fitting if you would allow the fighting pits to open once again. It would be your wedding gift to his star and to your loving people, a sign that you had embraced the ancient ways and customs of Murine, and most pleasing to the gods as well, 
the green grace added in her soft and kindly voice. A bride price paid in blood. Daenerys was weary of fighting this battle. Even Sir Barristan did not think she could win. No ruler can make a people good, Selmy had told her. Baelor the Blessed prayed and fasted, and built the seven as splendid a temple as any gods could wish for. Yet he could not put an end to war and want. A queen must listen to her people, Danny reminded herself. After the wedding, Hisdar will be king. Let him reopen the fighting pits if he wishes. I want no part of it. Let the blood be on his hands, not mine. She rose. If my husband wishes me to wash his feet, he must first wash mine. I will tell him so this evening. She wondered how her betrothed would take that. She need not have been concerned. His Darzola Rock arrived an hour after the sun had set. His own tokar was burgundy, with a golden stripe and a fringe of golden beads. Danny told him of her meeting with Resnak and the Green Grace as she was pouring wine for him. These rituals are empty, Hisdar declared. Just the sort of thing we must sweep aside. Mirene has been steeped in these foolish old traditions for too long. He kissed her hand and said, Daenerys, my queen, I will gladly wash you from head to heel if that is what I must do to be your king and consort. To be my king and consort you need only bring me peace. Skahaz tells me you have had messages of late. I have. Hisdar crossed his long legs. He looked pleased with himself. Yungai will give us peace, but for a price. The disruption of the slave trade has caused great injury throughout the civilized world. Yungai and her allies will require an indemnity of us, to be paid in gold and gemstones. Gold and gems were easy. When else? The Yunkai will resume slaving, as before. Astapor will be rebuilt as a slave city. You will not interfere. The Yunkai resumed their slaving before I was two leagues from their city. Did I turn back? King Cleon begged me to join with him against them, and I turned a deaf ear to his pleas. I want no war with Yunkai. How many times must I say it? What promises do they require? Ah, there is the thorn in the bower, my queen, said his star Zolo Rock. Sad to say, Yungai has no faith in your promises. They keep plucking the same string on their harp, about some envoy that your dragon set on fire. Only his tokar was burned, said Danny scornfully. Be that as it may... They do not trust you. The men of New Geese feel the same. Words are wind, as you yourself have so oft said. No words of yours will secure this peace for Mirene. Your foes require deeds. They would see us wed, and they would see me crowned as king to rule beside you. Danny filled his wine cup again, wanting nothing so much as to pour the flagon over his head and drown his complacent smile. Marriage or carnage? A wedding or a war? Are those my choices? I see only one choice, your radiance. Let us say our vows before the gods of geese and make a new Mirene together. The queen was framing a response when she heard a step behind her. The food, she thought. Her cooks had promised her to serve the noble Hisdar's favorite meal dog and honey, stuffed with prunes and peppers. But when she turned to look, it was Sir Barristan standing there, freshly bathed and clad in white, his longsword at his side. "'Your grace,' he said, bowing. "'I am sorry to disturb you, but I thought that you would want to know at once. The storm crows have returned to the city with word of the foe. The Yunkishmen are on the march, just as we had feared.' A flicker of annoyance crossed the noble face of Hisdar Zolorak. The queen is at her supper. These cell swords can wait. Sir Barristan ignored him. I asked Lord Dario to make his report to me, as your grace had commanded. 
He laughed and said that he would write it out in his own blood if your grace would send your little scribe to show him how to make the letters. Blood? said Danny, horrified. Is that a jape? No, no, don't tell me. I must see him for myself. She was a young girl, and alone, and young girls can change their minds. Convene my captains and commanders. Hisdar, I know you will forgive me. Mirin must come first. Hisdar smiled genially. We will have other nights. A thousand nights. Sir Barristan will show you out. Danny hurried off, calling for her handmaids. She would not welcome her captain home in a tow car. In the end, she tried a dozen gowns before she found one she liked, but she refused the crown that Jeekwe offered her. As Dario Naharis took a knee before her, Danny's heart gave a lurch. His hair was matted with dried blood, and on his temple a deep cut glistened red and raw. His right sleeve was bloody almost to the elbow. "'You're hurt,' she gasped. "'This?' Dario touched his temple. "'A crossbowman tried to put a quarrel through my eye, but I outrode it. I was hurrying home to my queen, to bask in the warmth of her smile.' He shook his sleeve, spattering red droplets. "'This blood is not mine. One of my sergeants said we should go over to the Yunkai. So I reached down his throat and pulled his heart out. I meant to bring it to you as a gift for my silver queen. But four of the cats cut me off and came snarling and spitting after me. One almost caught me, so I threw the heart into his face. Very gallant, said Sir Barristan, in a tone that suggested it was anything but. But do you have tidings for her grace? Hard tidings, Sir Grandfather. Astapor is gone, and the slavers are coming north in strength. This is old news and stale, growled the shave pate. Your mother said the same of your father's kisses, Dario replied. Sweet queen, I would have been here sooner, but the hills are a swarm with Yunkish cell swords. For free companies, your storm crows had to cut their way through all of them. There is more, and worse. The Yunkai are marching their host up the coast road, joined by four legions out of New Geese. They have elephants, a hundred, armored and towered. The Lossy Slingers, too, and a corps of Carthine camelry. Two more Giscari legions took ship at Astapor. If our captives told it true, they will be landed beyond the Skahazadan to cut us off from the Dothraki Sea. As he told his tale, from time to time a drop of bright red blood would patter against the marble floor, and Danny would wince. How many men were killed? she asked when he was done. Of ours? I did not stop to count. We gained more than we lost, though. More turncloaks? More brave men drawn to your noble cause. My queen will like them. One is an axeman from a the Basilisk Isles. A brute, bigger than Belwas. You should see him. Some Westerosi, too. A score or more. Deserters from a the Windblown, unhappy with the Unkai. They'll make good storm crows. If you say. Danny would not quibble. Mirin might soon have need of every sword. Sir Barristan frowned at Dario. Captain, you made mention of four free companies. We know of only three. The Windblown, the Long Lances, and the Company of the Cat. Sir Grandfather knows how to count. The second sons have gone over to the Yunkai. Dario turned his head and spat. That's for Brown Ben Plum. When next I see his ugly face, I will open him from throat to groin and rip out his black heart. Danny tried to speak and found no words. She remembered Ben's face the last time she had seen it. It was a warm face, a face I trusted. 
dark skin and white hair, the broken nose, the wrinkles at the corners of his eyes. Even the dragons had been fond of old brown Ben, who liked to boast that he had a drop of dragon blood himself. Three treasons will you know, once for gold and once for blood and once for love. Was Plum the third treason or the second? And what did that make Sir Jorah, her gruff old bear? Would she never have a friend that she could trust? What good are prophecies if you cannot make sense of them? If I marry his dar before the sun comes up, will all these armies melt away like morning dew and let me rule in peace? Dario's announcement had sparked an uproar. Resnock was wailing, the shave pate was muttering darkly, her blood riders were swearing vengeance. Strong Belwas thumped his scarred belly with his fist and swore to eat Brown Ben's heart with plums and onions. Please, Danny said, but only Missande seemed to hear. The queen got to her feet. Be quiet! I have heard enough! Your grace, Sir Barristan went to one knee. We are yours to command. What would you have us do? Continue as we planned. Gather food as much as you can. If I look back, I am lost. We must close the gates and put every fighting man upon the walls. No one enters, no one leaves. The hall was quiet for a moment. The men looked at one another. Then Resnock said, What of the Astapuri? She wanted to scream to gnash her teeth and tear her clothes and beat upon the floor. Instead, she said, Close the gates! Will you make me say it thrice? They were her children, but she could not help them now. Leave me! Dario, remain! That cut should be washed, and I have more questions for you. The others bowed and went. Danny took Dario Naharis up the steps to her bedchamber where Erie washed his cut with vinegar and Jeekwe wrapped it in white linen. When that was done, she sent her handmaids off as well. "'Your clothes are stained with blood,' she told Dario. "'Take them off.' "'Only if you do the same.' He kissed her. His hair smelled of blood and smoke and horse, and his mouth was hard and hot on hers. Danny trembled in his arms." When they broke apart, she said, I thought you would be the one to betray me. Once for blood and once for gold and once for love, the warlock said. I thought... I never thought Brown Ben. Even my dragons seemed to trust him. She clutched her captain by the shoulders. Promise me that you will never turn against me. I could not bear that. Promise me. Never, my love. She believed him. I swore that I should wed his Darzola Rock if he gave me ninety days of peace. But now... I wanted you from the first time that I saw you. But you were a sellsword. Fickle. Treacherous. You boasted that you'd had a hundred women. A hundred? Dario chuckled through his purple beard. I lied, sweet queen. It was a thousand, but never once a dragon. She raised her lips to his. What are you waiting for? 